I'm Heidi Zuckerman. I am the Nancy and Bob Magoon CEO and Director here at the Aspen Art Museum. And I appreciate you joining us tonight for the Another Look Lecture. It's presented as part of our ongoing Questrom Lecture Series, supported by the Questrom Education Fund. So um, this is a series that invites experts in their fields to give unexpected insight into the art that we have here on view. So we're really excited tonight to welcome Roaring Fork Valley's own Pete McBride to respond to the Fishley Vice work, The Visible World. Uh, that features 3,000 photographs that the artist took as part of their global travels. It's on view in Gallery One, and if you haven't seen it, or even if you have, uh, when Pete is done talking, we're gonna go downstairs and take a look at it again. So, Pete has spent two decades studying the world with a camera. He's a self-taught photographer, filmmaker, writer, and public speaker. He has traveled on assignment to over 75 countries. Uh, he was National Geographic's Adventure of the Year last year, and some kids have affectionately started calling him the Lorax of the Rivers. <laughs> he asked me if I knew who the Lorax is, and I said, yes, I have two kids. <laughs> so um, the format for tonight will begin with a presentation by Pete, a brief Q&A uh, for burning questions about his work, and then uh, going downstairs with Pete to look at the visible world and continuing the conversation there. So thank you for being here. And without further ado, Pete. Thanks, Heidi. Thank you. Thank you guys for coming out. I'm going to stay over on this side so you can see the images. And I'm going to, I'm going to drive this machine here. Uh, it is, it's fun. It's an honor to come out and talk about uh, my work. It's always a little bit it's humbling to talk about it in this place, of course. Um, and so what I'm going to do tonight is just take you on a little tour of how I end up in the projects that I do. Um, I, of course, I grew up in this valley. I'm one of those rare natives. This is a f photo I snapped of the Roaring Fork Valley um, last summer. But the, the irony is that while I live here and it's such a beautiful spot is I, I don't work here that often. Um, I, I usually go away to photograph. Um, this is one of my first journalistic assignments I did as I went all the way to Chihuahua, Mexico with about $300 in my pocket, um, an old Nikon film camera, and I followed illegal immigrants coming back to work in this valley. And this is when I was first getting started as a journalist. And um, I'm showing you this image because this was one of the last pictures on my roll of film. This is back in the day when we had film and used 36 frames. This was a 36 frame and I snapped it and I realized that I had all my settings wrong and I completely screwed up and I could, couldn't believe what I'd done. This guy was taking the train north to come visit his son who worked and lived in El Jebel. And it turned out, and coincidentally, being one of my favorite images, because the settings were a little dark and blurry, and it, it created a moodiness to it. So I was learning as I went, basically. I never studied photography, but I realized quickly in situations like this that you can learn from your mistakes. Uh, I worked at an, as a newspaper photographer and a writer here in the Valley. I worked for High Country News. I actually worked for the Aspen Skiing Company doing their photography. And after clawing my way, um, for quite a few years, I was able to get on the front of this aircraft, which is called the Vickers Vimy. Uh, we uh, presented this story of reenacting the first African air passage through Africa uh, in this World War I replica biplane. It um, flies at top speed of 65 miles an hour. It falls out of the sky at 60 miles an hour. Uh, that's actually my head in the front. Um, that's the bombardier seat. Uh, I took this photograph through a remote wire system out here. But this became um, my first story for National Geographic. Uh, basically maxed out credit cards, maxed out everything we did um, to basically be a, a photographer on this journey. National Geographic said no when we started this, but fortunately um, uh, they were able to see the pictures afterwards. They said you'd have to crash. We did. Uh, they, they had all sorts of stipulations, which we ended up fulfilling with some of our misadventures. Uh, I do recall very fondly, this is almost 20 years ago. This was 1999. We lift off from uh, Manston Ray to England and um, we're bouncing along and um, you can barely hear anything. It's very windy. Uh, this is a United Airlines captain in the lower left, Mark Rebholtz, the guy who built this replica aircraft, John Lanou on the right. And Manson Radar comes on the radio and says, 
uh, our call sign is November 1 Mike Yankee. They don't know really what aircraft you're in. And they said, November 1 Mike Yankee, you are clearing mountain radar. And Mark, the pilot, comes on and says, uh, Roger that, Mike Yankee. Over. And then, <laughs> no, nothing. And then we keep flying and suddenly the, radar, the radio guys come on. Like, Mike Yankee, uh, excuse us for asking, but would you happen to be the Vickers Vimy? Mark's like, uh, copy that, Mike Yankee over. And then uh, silence. <laughs> and air traffic controllers, there's some, if, you're, if you're not a pilot, basically they don't chit chat over the radio. They never chit chat. It's all business and call signs. And he comes back on and says, oh, right, right, gold speed, lads. Uh, it took, in 1920, when the first plane went through Africa, it took them 43 days. It took us 58 days in 1999, uh, partly political reasons. We had engine problems. We crashed. But basically, this became my first big magazine feature that I wrote, uh, Victoria Falls. A lot of it became an aerial perspective. And it led to uh, me working as a photojournalist when I came out, um, a travel photographer, a photojournalist, uh, some fine art. Uh, but I was getting calls from magazines to go, at this point, all over the world, a lot of story pitches. This is this thing I did for Smithsonian. This is uh, a group called Bandaloop that uh, decided that the, the horizontal world of dancing is too boring, so they do it in the vertical world. They, this is 3,000 feet off the floor of Yosemite. Uh, I, I spent a lot of time doing adventures. I was getting sent out a lot. Um, I hooked up with a guy named John Bowermaster, and we did a lot of ocean kayak trips where we were paddling. This is in the far reaches of the Tuamotus, paddling between these atolls, these ancient volcanic islands. And then uh, I was asked to go to Mount Everest to do a story not on climbing to the summit, uh, which we all think of as the only reason to go to Everest, but I actually went to cover the Sherpa that, that build the route for everyone else to go to the summit. So I spent a lot of time hanging on ropes inside the ice fall, which is a very dangerous part of the world, very scary. And I quickly realized that while I loved doing the adventure, I liked looking and turning my camera on the scenes you often don't see. So this is the, the unexpected um, wiffle ball championships at base camp at Mount Everest at 18,000 feet. Uh, at the time, Cuba was somewhat off limits, and of course everyone wanted to see images, so I got an assignment to go down there and study the world with a lens of Cuba, of course, the street life, the world, the famous boxing that you may have seen or may not in Cuba. Of course, they're known for their music. For me, travel photography is, is, a, is a fun challenge of blending photojournalism and being on your toes, and how do you figure out how to make an image of a ballerina in a decrepit old falling down building? And of course, it's, it's playing with light, it's playing with shadow, it's playing with a slow shutter speed, which you see where, you, where the spirit of her comes out. I spent a lot of time looking at ways to see things a little differently. Um, so how do you take a crumbling street in Cuba and try to make it a little different? Of course, when I do my work for National Geographic, the editors say, uh, when you come back and you don't have an image that they want or something unique, you say, well, it was, it was dirty and it was rainy and it was cold and I was tired. And, and they've said to me often, well, we don't publish excuses. So they don't care what you deal with down there. You have to come back with compelling, interesting images. So whether I'm in the streets of Cuba or they were sending to the far reaches of, of Kenya, northern Kenya, of course, reflection is always a, a fun way to see things a little different. This is the Samburu uh, in northern Kenya, uh, a place that I was actually recently, a place that's been very challenged with water. So as I, I started doing these stories, I became more and more interested in the stories around water and people, uh, the interaction, particularly in Africa, around wildlife and our, our disappearing resources. This was a story in Malawi of a park where they're challenged by, by space and, and wildlife corridors, uh, the natural corridors where wildlife would move from one area to another are getting threatened by, by people developing it. So this last summer, they actually moved 500 elephants. Uh, it's the largest relocation of any wildlife population in Africa. Uh, 500 elephants are darted from the air. Uh, at different times, they would take a family at one time, uh, usually up to 12. They dart them. They have about uh, an hour uh, for the anesthesia to work. They crane them upside down. It, they're only upside down for a couple minutes. They put them in a truck, wake them up, and they ship them off to their new home. So photographically, this was very challenging because it's 
there's a lot going on. Uh, there's a lot of potential danger. Uh, elephants are sometimes waking up and that. But uh, for me, it was trying to find the layering of how to capture a photo where you're showing the movement, but also the amazing depth here and the amazing bottom of what does a foot of an elephant look like? And what is it? I was enamored by it, so I wanted to show these, these gnarled, beautiful feet. But as I was doing a lot of this work, I became very interested in, in our relationship to water, because everywhere I went, water became a challenge. Um, uh, everybody was talking about their challenges with water, uh, typically too little contamination. Uh, many places where it's drying up, uh, the rivers, the, the watershed, these, these arteries that basically sustain us, uh, whether it's in the desert or, or as it's coming into the ocean, this kind of this mix, this interaction of, of water to not only our natural system, but to us, whether it's a city of 7 million people or, or not, um, what is the situation, for example, of the Hudson River? Is it getting cleaned? Is it getting worse? In this case, it's actually getting better, um, which is a good news story. But most stories around water have been very challenging and getting more and more dire. So after doing what was roughly about 15 years of running around the world and doing some foolish things, um, I decided I really wanted to sink my teeth into a, a bigger project, a bigger story on water. This was a trip we did in Antarctica uh, where we took kayaks down the coast of it about climate change, the shrinking ice, um, and I felt after a six-week trip that I really needed to swim. Uh, nobody else on the boat was dumb enough to swim in the 29 degree water, so I set up my camera and went and tried to show off and do a flip. I failed on the flip, I landed on the ice. Um, I barely made it back to the boat. Uh, your legs and arms quickly go numb when you're in 29 degree water. All your blood rushes to your central core. Um, Patagonia got the got uh, wind of this photograph and they realized I was wearing Patagonia underwear and they asked if they could use it and quickly became an ad and they, the, the title of it was Got Shrinkage. Not really <laughs> sure what they were talking about, but um, uh, it definitely, I think at this point in my career working behind the lens is um, my wanderlust and, and desire to go out and just basically on some level tell other people's stories was diminishing, was shrinking. So I came back home. Uh, this is Chair Mountain. Um, many of you probably know it. It's above Carbondale. And I decided to do a story in part. Uh, my father was telling, always telling me you should look at your local area and, and the water situation here is changing. Uh, my dad, who's actually here, John, my mom. Um, and so the idea was to follow our water uh, from the top of the Colorado River the watershed, 1,500 miles, but look at it in a different way. Try to take an artistic approach to looking at um, this, this Southwest lifeline, basically, that supports 40 million people and goes through seven states. Those, horse, those are shadows, those are not napping horses. <laughs> but using the aerial perspective to get a very different look because we've seen a lot of adventure pictures, so to speak, of the Colorado River. But not only look at the river, look at how the water is being used. What are the straws in the drink? This is a potash mine near Moab. If some of you have been there, they, they actually dye the water blue to speed up evaporation leave the potash behind. Of course, looking for the, the perfect symmetry of, of nature too that, um, that we're, we're blessed with in this area and seeing how water has helped sculpt that. This is inside the Grand Canyon, one of the stillest areas of the entire Colorado River, uh, formed naturally by a rapid downstream. This is inside Marble Canyon. So I was looking above the river, but also getting below it, looking at the, the species that depend on it. This is one of the endangered species, the humpback chub. Uh, there's only about 8,000 of them left. They live in this little side tributary of the Grand Canyon called the Little Colorado. You'll see more of it later. Um, there, are, there are four endangered species of fish on the Colorado River now, and two have already gone extinct. So. Uh, it's remarkable how our water systems are changing, not just the water, but the species that depend on them. Uh, of course, getting back to the aerial perspective to try to get that unique look, not just of the beauty, but how we have created these colossal, remarkable pieces of engineering that bookend uh, places like the Grand Canyon. That's Hoover Dam, built in 1935. At the time, was the largest dam in the world. Uh, the situation, as I'm sure everyone in this room is aware of, is that our water in the West is diminishing rapidly. Uh, the Colorado River is at all-time lows. Uh, Lake Mead 
is at its lowest um, it's ever seen since they built the dam in 1935. Las Vegas is so concerned about the water situation that they spent a billion dollars to bore a hole underneath Lake Mead so they can have access to their allocation of water. Uh, all of this, of course, I was trying to document something that's a challenging story, can be a depressing story, but I was trying to frame it in a way to create a, a beautiful framework around it. I was trying to to, to photograph in a way to captivate people with an artistic look, but also to reveal information that isn't always that, that uplifting. This is the Central Arizona Project. This carries water from the Colorado River to Phoenix and Tucson, uh, 336 miles uphill, which is pretty remarkable. But the idea was to look at water um, and, of course, what is being, where is it going? The biggest straw, of course, is agriculture. Uh, this is down near the Colorado River on the border of Arizona and California, near the Mexican border. And um, cattle, of course, beef is a, is a huge straw. It's a huge suck of water, up to 750 gallons per hamburger. Uh, same with a cotton t-shirt, which of course I'm wearing one. Uh, so the idea as I went, as I was learning how we use our water, um, but the results of what's happened is at the end of the river, of course, is we've dried it up. So the Colorado River ran to the sea for six million years, and it hasn't run naturally to the sea uh, since 1998. We've completely dried up what was the largest desert estuary in North America. And some people say, well, well, who cares? We're putting the water towards agriculture and use and energy. But I can guarantee you this guy, a Cocopo Native American who lives down there and used to be 20,000 people, this was his native fishing grounds, he cares. Um, and if you care about biodiversity and fish life and the interaction with, with water and ecosystems and, and the 200,000 birds that migrate through that area, then you start to be like, well, maybe we do care because these systems are con connected and related to everything. Uh, there was a remarkable story, though, because enough people do care about this and they've been working behind the scenes that three years ago they released this, this somewhat titanic pulse of water down the Colorado River Delta. Uh, it was Mexico's allocated water, was less than 1% of the river, and they released it to see what would happen. And the amazing thing was the ecology and the ecosystem bounced back to life. The, the, the ecological memory down here in this delta that we have dried up com almost completely, 95% of what we've turned into desert, bounced back to life. But to me, what was amazing was the, the population of Mexican people that came out in joyous numbers. Uh, they came out in their horses and were dancing and, and singing and the taco carts showed up, all the boats came out, and it was this giant fiesta celebrating their long lost friend, the river, the uh, Rio Colorado. And so it was a realization to me that, yes, we, we really psychologically do depend on these systems, water systems. So three years ago, uh, they, uh, in part from, I did a book on the Colorado River and did some films the Mexican delegation used that work to um, work with the U.S. and they made a new treaty. They released this water, less than 1%, and three years ago was the first time the Colorado River flowed to the sea um, since 1998. So that is the tiny little bit of trickle that's reaching the Sea of Cortez, making its final 1,500 mile leap. Uh, it recharged the delta, it flushed a lot of the saline salt situation out of there, and um, became, many say a success, many would say it was somewhat wasteful of that amount of water. They should have diverted it and put it into more um, ecological restoration programs. But I think to see this happen and see what we can do is really, really uplifting. So from this project, it led me to realize that it's not just the Colorado River, this Western river that is, is challenged, it's many great rivers. So I, I was curious about um, if we have turned our back on this river I was curious about what would it be like to follow a river where people actually embrace it and they believe it to be, be actually holy or sacred. So I went to the Himalaya, I proposed a story to National Geographic and they got on board and we went to the top of the Himalaya. This is Mount Shibling at the top of the Ganges River, which coincidentally runs the same length as the Colorado, 1500 miles, also through seven states and two countries. The Colorado River supports 40 million people. The Ganges supports 400 million people. So a little difference in scale, but I was curious about looking at the systems around it. Uh, again, I used a bit of an aerial approach. Uh, 
very challenging in India. Uh, I, a lot of the aerial images I did here, I was able to use my father because he's a great pilot and he charged me a fair rate. In India, it took me, it took me uh, two, almost two years to get access to get up in the air with one military helicopter pilot, which you see this image. And um, when I showed up, I we long email discussions. This is what I need. This is what we'll pay. This is where we'll go, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but to give you just a little behind the scenes of what it takes to get an image like this in, in foreign parts of the world, I show up um, and. He says, uh, the weather's bad, so um, I brought my engineer because I'm nervous about flying in the Himalaya. We've had a lot of challenges. I'm like, that's fine, no problem. Uh, can I sit by the open window? And he says, oh, no, Mr. Peter, my engineer needs to sit next to the window. And I'm like, but we've talked about this. I can't photograph through a window. It creates bad light, tint on the photographs and the video. Oh, no, Mr. Peter. And we go back and forth for about an hour. And finally, after about an hour, the the uh, Indian engineer walks over to the middle of us, he's about 95 pounds, and he goes, Mr. Peter, uh, you could sit on my lap. <laughs> so this is what the Ganges, Upper Ganges River looks like when you're sitting on the lap of a 95 pound engineer <laughs> crouching through the window of a military helicopter. Uh, what's interesting about the Ganges River, um, many of us in this room like the outdoors and we may know what the situation is with our rivers. Most people don't. Most people, rivers are just there, water comes from the tap. That's the end of the story. In India, they believe this river is literally um, a sacred holy river. It will wash their sins away. It is believed to be a, a divine incarnation of, of um, a Hindu goddess. And so they come to the river, the banks of the river, every day at five o'clock. This is not a, a giant festival. This is not a giant party. This is an, an idle Tuesday, and just an average Tuesday, and everyone's coming to do a Hindu happy hour. They basically sing songs. They pray to the Maganga, Mother Ganges, and they give their offerings. They'll bathe. They'll put in candles. You see the little, they're called diyas. This is a long exposure, so you see the little candles floating down. Um, and it's really, it's really quite remarkable. They really embrace it. Of course, part of the problem is they embrace it a little bit too much. They're loving it to death. Um, they also believe it's somewhat of an environmental conundrum that they, um, because the river is holy, you can't hurt God. God is almighty, God is all powerful. So you, if you throw your, your offering into the river that may include pl plastic or heavy metals or, or toxic of anything, um, it's not going to hurt your God. So uh, it's created a real dilemma on the, 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 the Ganges on many levels. It's the most sacred river in the world. It's also believed to be the most contaminated. So we followed it uh, to do a film, and this was a, a magazine story for National Geographic, again, trying to find ways to see it differently, uh, get different perspective on how people use it, love it, abuse it. Uh, of course, a lot of it is this idea of overuse and, and contamination and, and garbage. Um, again, it comes back to, for me, it's a, it's, it can be very challenging and very depressing work sometimes. You're working, I spent three days in this garbage dump because it's right on the banks of the Ganges River. How do you make a beautiful picture that'll hold people's attention talking about garbage and waste when you're hanging out in a dump? Um, Fortunately, this cow walked into the scene and started glowing orange from the burning plastic. Uh, but that's part of the, the part of the job. This was kind of the concept behind of, of what's on the banks, how it's getting contaminated. I also spent a lot of time getting access to places. Uh, it took three days to get access into this leather tannery. There are, uh, there are 125 leather tanneries on the banks of the Ganges River in, in the city of Kampur. Uh, they use predominantly chromium. Chromium is one of the most toxic chemicals in the world, potentially. Kidney failure, lung disorder, dementia, the list goes on and on. These guys are basically working in 115 degrees, breathing fumes of chromium. Uh, of course, we're looking at festivals as we go. Um, the interaction of how elephants are still part of the Hindu culture and then where people come to see their, their world uh, either come to an end or start anew. So many people believe that in the Ganges River, if you are brought and you die here at the banks of the Ganges in Varanasi and your ashes are thrown into the river, 
you will break the cycle of reincarnation. So it starts your life anew. Um, this, of course, was all part of the story of the contamination and the love um, and the challenges around it. Um, and even at the very end of the river, um, where you th think you're going to see a beautiful open, uh, you, you run into a bunch of dogs that might be related, I'm not sure. But this was um, another sacred place where everyone was doing offerings. And um, it just showed that the, the, the love and the affection, but the, the challenges were, were all throughout the river. Uh, we did a short, we did a documentary, uh, um, but this is just a one minute little soundscape of what, it, what this experience was like. So that's 1,500 that's 15 miles in, in basically 70 seconds. Uh, I'm going to finish with a project that I never expected to do, uh, in part because I never, I never thought it needed attention. But um, I was asked to come to the Grand Canyon uh, a couple years ago and do a talk about the Colorado River and the challenges of water there. And when I was there, uh, when I did this, this book and this project about the Colorado River, I, I basically zoomed through the Grand Canyon. I got some beautiful pictures. I documented some endangered species of fish, but basically I, um, I figured that is, the, that is the protected pearl on the necklace of that river, and it does not need much attention. It's a national park. It's the most protected piece of real estate in the world, in theory. But when I showed up, they said, there's a lot of challenges going on here. Are you aware of it? And I said, no, I had no idea. Uh, and so somehow um, I went on a hike and the idea was that, well, maybe I could do something different. Um, of course, in my world, the idea is how to do it, everything a little different. So the idea um, came to me and uh, I've been working on it ever since. It's been almost three years in the making, but this is um, a film I'm working on now. This is a little trailer to give you an idea of what this project was. I'm going to be honest. I'm not sure I really like hiking that much. With a heavy pack and no guarantee of water, it's hard, stressful, and very slow. Sure, hiking can lead to some zen-like moments, but not so much if you're lost, really tired, and dehydrated. Yet there's something about the Grand Canyon and its rocky, secret world It is alluring magical even. So in the fall of 2015, my friend and author, Kevin Fedarko and I, set out to walk the entirety of the Grand Canyon from east to west. In order to understand the insanity of this venture, you first have to know a little bit about this place. In stretches, it is 18 miles wide and over a mile deep. So deep, in fact, you could stack five Empire State Buildings, one on top of the other, inside. It is 277 miles long if you're floating the Colorado River, but on foot, 
by the time you've gone up and back down the numerous side canyons, it's more like 700 miles. Oh yeah, and for most of it, there's no trail. As a result, more people have stood on the surface of the moon than have completed a continuous through hike of the Grand Canyon. It may have been the brushiest, scratchiest, longest day. Wow. Okay. I fell into a barrel cactus. And now I got all these weird lumps on my arm. This is wild. I wonder what the hell we've gotten ourselves into. I was told that uh, yesterday would be the hardest day. I, I don't see any difference whatsoever between yesterday, the day before yesterday, and the first day, and today. <laughs> my body's falling apart. Kevin and I would be the first journalists ever to tackle this hiking lunacy. We plan to complete our mission over a year, watching the seasons change and teaming up with hardened canyon veterans oh, that's help us find our way and our legs. We're running low on food. And uh, if we don't keep walking, we're not gonna get to our food cache in time. So my big question is, when do I start to panic? Right now. Beyond that challenge, something else drew us on this quest. The Grand Canyon is facing an unprecedented array of pressures from all four points on the compass. Development projects are poised to change the integrity of perhaps the most monumental landscape in America. perspective on this secret world and what's at stake to be lost. I'll walk you through some of the, the photos because we're talking about photography, of course, tonight. Um, this first image, um, I think, is what how I thought this hike would be. I thought it would be this. Um, I had some rosy illusions that I'd be walking through Tangerine Light on, on some beaches and it would be a raft trip on foot. Um, as you saw in the video, there really is no trail and that was the only beach we really saw. But we're really walking in places like this the whole time. Uh, and so Within six days, uh, we became, I became gravely ill. Kevin sprained both ankles and we realized we completely underestimated what we were doing. And we basically fled the canyon and never wanted to go back. This was six days of what was gonna be a year long trip. Uh, it was a bit of a, of a lightning flash that, holy crap, we've, we've really signed on to something that's a lot harder, a lot more challenging than we ever anticipated. Uh, but we, thankfully ran into this community of canyon lovers that live in and around the canyon, mostly in Flagstaff, and they basically rallied around us and said, you've got to do this. You have to. The canyon needs you to do this. This story needs to come out. And so what, this is a presentation about travel photography, but, but my travel photography, of course, is usually mission driven on a lot of it because I love beautiful imagery, but I like imagery that has a deeper story. So. We, we licked our wounds, we retooled our system, and we went back in, um, and we came back, and we, we hiked uh, the first 150 miles. Um, we figured out how to do it. It was still challenging, but um, we made it to this point, which is the confluence. Little Colorado meets the main stem of the Colorado, believed to be sacred by three Native American tribes, many more. It's, uh, they say this is where life begins. Uh, we hiked up right above the confluence, uh, the Walter Powell route, and we met a bunch of, of these women up here, these Navajo women that are fighting um, what is the next proposal, which is from basically where they're standing back down to the confluence is a proposed tram 1.2 miles long that would carry up to 10,000 people a day into the canyon. To give you some perspective of numbers, 
There are 26,000 people that go down the Grand Canyon a year by boat, commercial, private. So in just three days, the tram would eclipse all the people that go through the Grand Canyon. So the Navajo are getting promised jobs, but many of them were kept out of the, out of the discussion. This woman, Alice Johnson, doesn't speak English. She's um, a 14th generation Navajo, has run sheep above the Grand Canyon, above the confluence her entire life, her grandmother's entire life, her great-grandmother's entire life. Um, they have started to find their voice and work collectively. It's, it's been a, an ongoing challenge. I'll, I'll update you at the end, but this is, this is what they believe is their Sistine Chapel. And they ask basically, why would, why would somebody come and build an escalator to the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel? Why would they come build a tram into our, into our sacred space here? Uh, the Hopi believe the same, the Zuni believe the same, the Wallapai, the Havasupai, they all believe this should be left untouched. So we, our idea was to walk through this, use basically the walk as a way to show what is at risk of being lost. Uh, we moved from there uh, downstream. We're now leaving the river. We're getting up onto the, the upper layers of rock. There's 40 layers of rock in the Grand Canyon. Uh, we made it to the south rim. This is where 6 million people come to visit the Grand Canyon a year, uh, which is remarkable. It's these, our national parks have reached a new level of popularity, but they do a remarkable job here. They offer a variety of ways to see it. You can actually walk on the rim on a paved trail. There's a handicapped trail. There's a braille trail. You can take a mule down. You can take a boat down. There's many of options. So there are ways to see it. If the, if the question is, is there enough access to the park? Um, I would say there is very significantly enough. But we move from there um, to understand another issue that's been brewing and, and growing and, and existed around the Grand Canyon for, for actually almost 100 years. It's uranium mining. It's some of the richest uranium mining in, in the country. Uh, they're doing it legally. This is Canyon Mine, which sits right next to the South Rim. Uh, there was a mine historically in the park that's now defunct called the Orphan Mine, but when we walk through, you can't drink the water below it because it's so contaminated from uranium. So the question is, should we be playing Russian roulette with, with not only the water system in the Grand Canyon, but the water that really flows into the Colorado River and is the lifeline to the southwest? So the Havasupai here are protesting in front of the mine, uh, which is the only operating mine right now. And there's a 20-year ban on future mining, new mines in Grand Canyon, but there was just a proposal to lift that by the current administration. The idea, too, is that Whatever happens on the rim of the Grand Canyon may seem like a separate world, but really anything that goes on in Grand Canyon affects all these secret oases and ecosystems that live below it. So what goes on above the rim affects below. And Grand Canyon looks like a dry, arid landscape. It has more biodiversity than any national park in all of America, including Hawaii, which is quite remarkable. There are birds in Grand Canyon that when the seasons change, they don't fly north to Alaska or they don't fly south. They just fly a few rock layers lower. They just stay within the canyon. It is that diverse. Uh, we left, as we moved downstream, of course, we left the stormy politics of the tram and the discussion there behind and the, the uranium. Uh, the seasons changed as it was late fall. We, we started feeling colder temperatures and then without much warning, it. Uh, was late January, we're moving, it's getting colder and colder, and then wham, it's suddenly winter. Uh, it snowed over a foot on us, and we walked through what was actually arguably the dangerous section of our whole hike around the Great Thumb Mesa. Uh, you get trapped up on this ledge just below the rim, you can't get out under the rim, you can't get below, so you're locked in. And when there's 12 inches of wet, sloppy snow and you're walking above 3,000 foot cliffs, it's a bit nerve wracking to say the least. Uh, there were times that this felt like a bit more of a grind than we were, felt like we were starting to question why we were doing it. Uh, but as we moved through, we would have moments of clarity, even if long days of struggle. Uh, because at the end of the day, no matter what we did, we'd realize that there was gonna be a moment where we would start to appreciate and look out and whether I was photographing or Kevin was writing, we would appreciate what this place was. And it's not just the rock around you or the river below you, but there is this river of, of stars that sweeps over you at night. So as my friend Kevin Fredarko always eloquently puts it um, when he talks about it, he says, the architect of the, the Grand Canyon, that the Colorado River that sweeps below you, 
At night, you see it perfectly reflected above you in the river of stars, and it feels like the canyon's holding you in its hand in this perfect limbo. By spring, uh, the snow quickly left. Temperatures soared again, up over 100. We moved into the western landscape. Um, some call it the Godscape. It's one of the hardest places to find water. We're carrying our own water. We're finding our own water every day. We're walking about 14 to sometimes 25 miles a day. Uh, so we are trying to make miles. And at the very western corner, we come into what has now become Helicopter Alley. Uh, I love flying. I love the idea of helicopters. I've filmed out of them for years. But this is an interesting part of the world for me. It's, uh, this didn't exist 10 years ago. Uh, this is a place where the, the Wallapai Native Americans have been granted access to fly helicopters into the canyon on their land right on the border of the National Park. They were given a hardship clause and they have taken advantage of it. They, they wanted to find some economic stability. It has exploded uh, completely in an unprecedented way. It has now become the busiest helicopter port in the entire world. So I went down there and I, I documented what a day of traffic looks like. This is what eight hours of traffic looks like, um, basically inside our, our national park. This is, the landing spot is, is the Wallapai land, but I am standing inside the national park. This is a photographic merge. Not all of these helicopters were in the air at one time. Each helicopter represents one flight. This was 363 flights on an average, I, I think it was Wednesday or Tuesday or Wednesday. This goes on seven days a week um, all year long. So. What didn't exist 10 years ago is now the busiest uh, helicopter area in the world. And of course, the idea of using photography while well, it's travel or photojournalism is to raise the questions. Uh, we left that area and hiked out an ancient Anasazi route that's 900, year old, uh, 900 year, years old. <coughs> Excuse me. It's um, spectacularly beautiful. Sadly, we listened to helicopters the whole way as we climbed up 3,500 vertical feet. Uh, it was exhausting, beautiful, but definitely took a toll on our bodies. I lost uh, 30 pounds. We only can carry enough for one meal a day, basically a freeze-dried meal. So it's a good weight loss program. <laughs> but after 71 days of walking, we came out to the far western corner on the north rim. And um, Kevin and I on, I think it was, uh, it was uh, in November, um, Roughly 750 to 800 miles, we're not sure. Uh, GPSs weren't always working, but we crossed the border. Um, and I think it, it example of this park and how beautiful and remarkable it is, it's 1,900 square miles, Grand Canyon National Park, and it's so remote in the far reach that the only thing delineating the border is three metal stakes. So we crossed it, and, and I think for me on many levels it was a story of friendship. Um, keeping each other going, trying to, as we try to document this place. Of course, the goal was to really shine a light on it uh, and the issues and how not just Grand Canyon is changing, but how this Grand Canyon is a bellwether for how our public lands are changing, our shared public lands. The f we basically came in with three lessons. The first one is that as we walk through, there is evidence of Native American activity throughout the canyon. It is remarkable. You can see here, this is where they store their food. These are granaries where they stored corn. We saw the tools uh, they used to hunt with and keep their corn throughout it. Uh, of course, we left them all there. We saw spear points that are 12,000 years old, Clovis points. Of course, we saw their art. Some of it is dated 4,000 years old, still on the rock face remarkably. Four color panels. Uh, we don't disclose where these are because there are looters that go in and actually steal them, carve them out. But everyone asks, where are, where did all these people go? And, uh, and having walking through it and all the issues, we realize that they haven't gone anywhere. They're still there. They, there are 11 Native American tribes that live around the national park, and many of them have been pushed out of the discussion on how to manage this place. Uh, and we're starting to see that, that that's playing a hand today, as some are pro-development, some are not. The other lesson we learned that everyone thinks of the Grand Canyon as defined by color and, and geography and landscape. Um, you guys can come in. I don't want to hold you back there. Sorry. No worries. Uh, but for us, while Grand Canyon is clearly 
delineated in, in its landscape and its geology and its remarkable rock layers that go back 1.7 billion years, the greatest thing we learned there was, was to find an auditory, was, was the stillness and the silence that I've never experienced anywhere else. It's so quiet in Grand Canyon that you can actually hear the, your heartbeat beating in, the, in, your, in your ear. Uh, my microphones on my cameras often didn't work because they've never been calibrated to a silence that, 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 that's so remarkably um, quiet. As fragile as that silence is, uh, we also realized that the night sky is one of the other equally fragile elements of Grand Canyon. When you look at a map of the United States and you see the swath of light and light pollution that's sweeping across, you see that there's a few dark spots left on the map. Grand Canyon is one of them. It is the only canyon you can see, the only canyon on the entire planet that you can see from space. So Kevin and I, we do this talk together a lot, but as we've worked on this project, um, it's made us think a lot about what, what it meant to us, what this project is, what's the imagery, what's the point. And we don't like to go around and preach about how magical this place is. We like to create questions. And, and one question that, that I like to leave is that how do, how do we see this place? Uh, do we see it as a sacred place that has these 4,000 year old paintings? that's sacrosanct that we should leave it as alone? Or is it a place of amusement that we just go in and check our, our lists, our, our Facebook lists or whatever it may be, our selfie photos? Uh, is it just for titillation? And I actually don't have an answer. I think that's a question for us as American public to decide, but I do know one thing. There are, if that clicks, there are over 400 amusement parks in America. And having spent over a year and bleeding, sweating, whining, crying, laughing, and pulling a lot of cactus needles out of my legs, I can guarantee you there is only one place that looks like this. So um, thank you guys for coming out. If you want to know more about this project around the Grand Canyon, um, I'm going to just I'll end with one update. Um, I'm, I'm doing a film which is titled, uh, for the time being, we're the working title, Dust in the Blood. I'm honored to have my editor here. He's, we're racing to finish it. It's going to be a feature length film that comes out next year, which tells the story. If you follow Instagram, that's my Instagram handle. And then one very uplifting piece of news about Grand Canyon is uh, just Last week, I was back down on the Navajo Nation. I went to Window Rock, which is the headquarters of the Navajo Nation, and I went to a special hearing on the Grand Escalade tram, which is still in the works. And led by this woman, Renee Yellowhorse, she is not part of the Navajo delegation, but she has fought for six years to rally her friends, her friends like Alice Johnson, who doesn't speak English, and all the other sheep herders that live out on the rim to get petitions. They got 90,000 signatures. Uh, they moved all over the Navajo Nation to talk about why that place is sacred. And the Navajo Nation, uh, in this special meeting, and a meeting that went uh, 11 hours, and I, I sat through the whole thing and filmed it. They didn't take a single pee break or a lunch break. They just charged through. Remarkably gracious, eloquent, um, but they were steadfast and very passionate. They voted 16 to 2 to shut the tram down. Because it, And it's, it, was, um, it was touching to know that um, a woman who has spent her life herding sheep, they all went and had dinner afterwards, um, but Renee and her friends, they drove back in a pickup uh, after the meeting and drove two and a half hours back to the, their home above the rim to go put their sheep away and, and basically said, we have to get back to work because now we have to save this place so the next tram doesn't come. But it's pretty amazing that these basically 12 Navajo women could, um, could take down a billion dollar development project that was proposed on the border, on their land on the border of the National Park. The non-Navajo developer, um, as he left the meeting, uh, flipped them all off, to give you a perspective. Um, but I'll, that was the great news. The next day, of course, the current administration proposed to lift all bans on uranium mining in the park. So it is an ongoing struggle with our public lands. But. Uh, if you're interested, um, I do always do do prints and so forth. 
But um, thank you guys, and we'll do some questions. So the, the boats in those picture, each boat represents one boat trip. People will fly a helicopter in and then they, they take a little 30 minute boat ride. And some of the boats are day trips coming down, down the river. Um, but um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, that was just a very average day. Yeah. So it's accessible by BQ? Uh, those helicopters are coming in from Las Vegas. So I went and did it to understand it. Uh, I, I took a helicopter at, uh, they pick you up in a limousine. Uh, you get in your helicopter, you go out and you have your champagne and your yogurt and your fruit. When I landed, there were 17 helicopters on the dirt around me. Our helicopter landed while all the others were taking off. So I had all the yogurt like blown all over me, which is kind of funny. Um, but uh, I was then back. Of course, the people we're with have never been there. I don't, I don't blame any for doing it. It's their first time in the Grand Canyon. It's great. Uh, it's just the, the balance seems a little skewed right now. Uh, but we flew back, um, had a view of the lake, um, the dropping water, and we're back, picked up by a limousine, and back in our hotel for breakfast. So you see the Grand Canyon with your champagne and yogurt and some info cards, and um, you can go you know, post your selfie by breakfast the same day. And I guess the question is, do we, is that's what our national park's for or not, you know? As they say, it's a Disney experience, not a natural resource experience. So I have a question. Thank you. First of all, um, how all these people come about to get permits to do this? How do these all get started? Who are these people? Are there just private business people that are allowed to, <coughs> to carry business in the park? And um, what platforms we have to, to stop this or make change? So the, the people in around um, Grand Canyon, and there's um, issues around many of our parks, but there is uh, the guy doing the tram. He tried to do a project on the Wallapai tribe where the helicopters are, and he, they didn't like him and they've kicked him off their tribal lands forever. The, that tribe partnered with um, a Chinese developer and they're in, they're in major lawsuit now. But basically what happens is these tribal lands don't have money. They partner with an outsider. The outside comes and makes promises. And then eventually the tribe will own the project that they propose. And so forth, um, all we've seen is contention and lawsuits and, and a bit of a sticky mess. Uh, how can you get involved? Uh, Grand Canyon Trust is a group that I work with. Um, they're very active and they're very good because they have people that work within the tribes. They have uh, Navajo women that work for Grand Canyon Trust. It's, it's not just whiteies working with the natives, it's a blend. Um, and then Renee works with Save the Confluence. Um, she's their own group. And um, they, of course, um, they don't even have enough gas money hardly to get to the meetings. So the groups I support around that are, are those two. But there's a lot of groups that are fighting different things, but those are the two top ones that I point towards. Yeah, Kurt. What about the housing project next to the South Rim? So there's a, another project happening um, on the South Rim that's going to be 4 million square feet of commercial space, and that's being proposed by an Italian company. Uh, they've been They've been stalled by a uh, Forest Service, revoked a permit, but most likely under this administration, they're going to give it back. Um, that's going to be 2,800 cost, um, luxury homes. So they're going to build basically a small, no offense, but a small Aspen on the um, Grand Canyon kind of style. Um, and uh, there's, you know, there is needed development around the park. People, there, you know, how, we, how, you, how you engage with our parks, we need need to have something because there, there's some a lot of old buildings and I've seen it but it's against the balance. When you see all these onslaughts um, against the environment around the world in your travels, do you ever sometimes lose hope or what gives you hope when you think about all the challenges? 
uh, do I lose hope with, with this stuff? Yeah, that there's, there's, uh, it, it, like I said, it can be, it can really take you down and you see a lot of, you see a lot of bum news. She gives me hope. Um, seeing the, the pulse flow in the Colorado River, which was basically happened because of a de Mexican delegation of three people and two white, uh, two American lawyers worked with them and, you know, and I was grateful they used some of my work. So it's, I think you can make, a, there is positive news that's happening and it's just happening in small increments, but there, it, it keeps you going. I have a question. Yeah. So 75 countries, you know, sorry, 75 countries rafting, flying, kayaking, uh, if you had a day that you could do anything that you wanted to, you know, absent any constraints of time or space, what would you do? Sit on the couch and read a book. <laughs> Play my mandolin. <laughs> now, I mean, seriously, yes, I would like to sit on my back porch and probably hang out. And, uh, but uh, what would I do? I'd, I would probably go walk the Escalone Trail in Grand Canyon without a camera, just take mental pictures. Yeah? How did you keep your camera powered up? How did I keep my camera powered up? So the behind the scenes story of how this was done was, it's a bit, it's complicated. Um, when I started, part of the reason that we failed so quickly, I didn't go into the depth of how miserably we failed when we started this project. But part of it was because as a photographer, we like to bring our cameras and lenses and you never, you, we always are prepared for the worst. You know, you, you, how could you do a National Geographic assignment with one camera? It's unheard of. Uh, but I was forced to, so I, after we failed, I, I pared down everything to one camera, one lens, one solar panel, and five batteries. And that was my whole life. So I would, um, as I would walk, I was always m taking inventory of where I am on batteries and where I am on, on card space and imagery. And then I would run the solar panel on my backpack and I could get about 30% of a battery charge in the day. Uh, and then if we stopped for an hour in the middle of the day, I could get about another 30% on a charge. So I could keep the batteries just enough, but by the end of our longest leg was a 19 day stretch and I had about 2% on one battery left. And I got one of, my, one of the images that actually was published in the magazine. And was this Correct. So I'm running video and still in the same little camera, the Sony. These mirror, uh, uh, it was a Sony Alpha series, the Sony A7R2. And what lens though? A 16 to 35. And that was it. That was it. <laughs> Just one last question. Yeah. Would you do it again? Would I do it again? Yeah, yeah you want to go? <laughs> uh, <coughs> uh, it's odd. You, yeah, I mean, maybe it's like, maybe it's like a motherhood. People forget the, the pain they've gone through. Um, I've started to forget a little bit of the, because um, I think that the landscape, on some level, particularly around Grand Canyon, kind of gets into your soul, and it it just doesn't let go. So I get I get called to want to go back to that place, but I. Uh, I'm, it's taking me a few more years to forget the, the number of cactus and cuts and so forth. But I would probably do it again in, in, in um, small sections. I don't, I don't need to walk the whole length. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us this evening. I'd like to remind you that our gallery below us is still open. That's the gallery that has the work that officially invites me to this whole world, so it inspired our invitation to Pete to join us this evening. Um, the Grand Canyon, we believe, is part of those 3,000 photographs, so you can take a look on your way out. It's one of the last chances that you have to see uh, the work before it closes. So please join me again in thanking Pete McBride for this work. Thanks.